You're listening to Big Table, a podcast about books and conversation presented by Hat and Beard Press, Dub Lab, and Gold Diggers in Los Angeles. I'm your host, JC Gable. For each episode, we speak to one author about a singular book in a long form interview. Each interview is then followed by a brief reading, sometimes from the same book being discussed, sometimes by a like minded title and a different author. But every episode does retain a loose theme throughout and is inspired by the work of radio host and oral historian Studs Turkle. Thanks for listening. I normally never riff off the cell copy of a book when introducing an author, but for Begin Again, James Baldwin's America and its Urgent Lessons for Our Own by Eddie Glaude Jr., I felt I had to crib a few graphs before we got into the conversation. We live, according to Eddie Glaude Jr., in the aftertimes, when the promise of Black Lives Matter and the attempt to achieve a new America has been challenged by the election of Donald Trump a racist president whose victory represents yet another failure of America to face the lies that it tells itself about race. In the story of James Baldwin's Crucible, Eddie Glaude Jr. suggests, we can find hope and guidance through our own aftertimes, this Trumpian era of shattered promises and white retrenchment. Mixing biography, drawn partially from newly uncovered interviews, with history, memoir, and trenchant analysis of our current moment, begin again is Glaude's endeavor to bear witness to the difficult truth of race in America today. Eddie and I caught up before the 2020 election by phone from his Princeton University office, where he is the James S. McDonald Distinguished University Professor of African American Studies at Princeton University. His book is beautifully written and a great introduction to the powerful work of Baldwin. He dedicated Begin Again to Baldwin's quote, beautiful heart. Here's Eddie Glaude Jr. Eddie, where did the germination of this book begin again? James Baldwin's America and its urgent lessons for our own come about. So, you know, I've been thinking with Baldwin for about 30 years, going all the way back to my graduate school days and teaching. Um, So he's been a part of how I've imagined my scholarly career, the way in which I think about American pragmatism and the like. But this particular book is so personal. Um, And so, you know, I decided, you know, while I was in Heidelberg, actually, that I was going to write a kind of intellectual history of the book. Well, let me say it differently, intellectual history of of, of Baldwin. And um, instead, something else emerged. uh, And this more intimate, um, um, this, um, this kind of close walking partner emerged. And so I was. I decided to think with him about our current moment. The tact that you've taken, or the arc, I should say, with the book, uh, Begin Again, is an interesting one. You you really kind of tie together two uh, books of civil rights writing and uh, polemics, I suppose you could call it, by Baldwin, uh, The Fire Next Time, which many people are familiar with, and then No Name in the Street, which came out... Uh, you know, in the early 70s and was delayed for many years because of just all the terrible things happening in the culture. I'm wondering uh, if you could speak a little bit to those two works and how they fit into the larger, uh, I guess, canon of Baldwin's writing. Yeah, you know, I, I've been teaching his nonfiction for, uh, at Princeton for, for the last couple of years. And what emerged, you know, starting with, you know, notes of a native son and making my way all the way to the evidence things not seen, was the kind of arc of his work, right? There are through lines. There's a continuity of theme. But each theme kind of gets, you know, revisited in light of the material conditions under which Baldwin is thinking. And so, so what's so fascinating is if Fire Next Time is the prophecy, No Name in the Street is the reckoning. I can't depend on the American moral credit to save some of the people whom I love. Mm -hmm. But you don't have that moral credit. You know, you told yourself, yourselves, 
and us for all these years nothing but lies now I want you to understand something I'm not interested in making an accusation I'm not even talking about the past I'm talking about the present this is not an accusation it is a plea for the life of this country because no matter what I say no matter what Martin said the despair in the ghetto, the despair throughout the country, accumulates with every hour. No Name in the Street is the first book written after King's assassination. He did a few journalistic pieces. He did the conversation with Margaret Mead and with Nikki Giovanni. But this is the book that emerged out of the collapse. So he collapses in 69 as a result of a failed relationship, as well as the kind of betrayal uh, that King's murder represented. And, and he tried to find something at the level of form and at the level of content to respond to what he had experienced and what he was seeing. And so as I was teaching Baldwin, trying to get my students to see the evolution of his thinking, this emerged. Right, that it's not a declension story, right, and that's that's what the older scholarship was suggesting, right? That Baldwin, Baldwin's work was, um, you know, after 1963, as James Campbell would say, his voice broke, uh, that he became bitter and angry and too polemical and had been kind of seduced by black power or um, the desire to remain the center of literary attention and the like had all compromised his art or his aesthetics. And, and I just saw something very different. What does it mean to write in a moment where the nation has fundamentally turned its back on the promise of the civil rights movement? What does it mean to write in the aftertime of this very compressed period, uh, as the nation not only elects Richard Nixon, but eventually elects Ronald Reagan, for someone for whom many activists, for many activists, someone as bad as, as, as George Wallace. Do you think that Donald Trump is more of a symptom of a larger problem that is disgusting as it is to admit, is really the blowback for a certain sector of America who were outraged by the idea of the first black president, uh, not just one, but two terms as president? You know, I never thought we would elect someone like this. And I should have known better. Right? I never thought he's so, Donald Trump, so obviously unqualified to be the leader of the United States, to be the leader of the quote-unquote free world, that I never thought that the country would, would make this choice, and they did. And, you know, I said it on Nicole Wallace, and I've said it and in, in begin again, that I, I, I overestimated white people. And as a lifelong reader of James Baldwin, I should have never done so. But I actually believe he is an existential threat, that, that Nixon and, and Reagan look tame next to Donald Trump. But what are caricatures? You know, the exaggerated nose, right? Uh, the, the drawn hat, the cartoonish nature of the head in relation to the body. Donald Trump is a caricature of a form of politics that has dominated America, the body politic, for a while. And so when we make him wholly other, and I write this in the book as well, that we can't exceptionalize Donald Trump. We have to see him not just simply through the lineage of Pat Buchanan and George Wallace and Tron Thurmond. We have to see him as a direct inheritor of Ronald Reagan. One of the things, it seems to me, that has always contributed to this adoration of innocence, this adoration of immaturity, so that we really do get representing us a post-adolescent who was almost 80 years old. And <laughs> And we think of this as, um, as a virtue. One of the things, though, that has always afflicted the American reality and the American vision is this aversion to history. Just as we reach for the fantasy of a Hollywood actor in 1980, we did the same thing in 2016. And both were charged. Uh, with reclaiming a certain idea of America, both drew on the phrase, make America great again. Ironic, yes. 
Do you think that the Democrats towing to the middle again in the end will come back to haunt them because a lot of the policies that they're espousing are of the corporatist third way Bill Clinton Democrat Party and ignores the racial divide uh, that has been brought back to light uh, this year in the case of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, etc. And, 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 and how do you think that the parties are going to address race in a post-Trumpian world? Well, you know, I think the Democratic Party um, has, has to grapple with its own complicity in producing the very world that we live in. The world that we inhabit isn't a result of just simply Republican policy. It is a, it is a, a consequence of third-way Democrats, triangulation, right? People who uh, have shifted the balance of concern from everyday ordinary people to Wall Street and Silicon Valley. Um, and the way in which race has been uh, a, a feature of our politics, you know, it is, you know, how people are driven and respond to white grievance and white fear and how parties have tried to mobilize that. And it seems to me that what we're facing now is a kind of reckoning. You know, part of the thing that we have to kind of deal with, right, is this idea that America is a white nation. What does it mean for us to really understand that at its root, on its lower frequencies, we're not some white nation in the vein of old Europe, but we have been um, uh, 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 living under the illusion that we are. And to deal with America in any, in any, uh, in any serious or nuanced way requires that we place aside the, that old myth and really encounter the, the incredible mixture, the incredible diversity at the heart of who we are. Uh, but that requires a kind of honesty, too, right? That we have to put aside the swaddling clothes of, of, our, of, our, of our innocent illusions and confront who we are. It is important to recognize that we did steal the land from the people who were here before us. We stole it. And we never honored a single treaty made with a person, that person known as the American Indian. And I repeat, we're not talking about the past, we're talking about the present. We did enslave millions of people because, for no other reason than because they were black, and we did make a lot of money out of slave labor. Neither is this uncommon. It is a part of human history. But, it is one thing to do something, and another to deny it. The nation has faced these moments of moral reckoning before, where it, has, where, where it had to choose whether or not it was going to actually finally leave behind, you know, this idea that white people are val ought to be valued more than others. You think about the second founding um, and radical reconstruction, the passage of the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments. You think about, you know... An, uh, Federal, you know the, the, you know the formation of the modern U.S. nation state. Uh, we can go on and on, right? But what do we get in response? We get Jim Crow, racial apartheid in the South. We get convict leasing. You know the federal, you know policing used as a way to conscript labor, black labor, to build cities like Birmingham. You get the ideology of Anglo-Saxonism justifying imperial ambition across the globe. At the very moment in which we're passing. Uh, these, you know, Jim Crow laws in the South, we are incorporating millions of black and brown people under our rule in places like the Philippines and, and Puerto Rico and Cuba and Haiti. You know, we can go on and on, right? Um, so we double down on the ugliness. In the mid-20th century, you know, with Dr. King and the Black Freedom Movement, what do we get in response to the Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65, right? We get calls for law and order cornerstone of the carceral state. We get the tax revolt in California where we see the erosion, not just simply of the great society, but the erosion of the social safety net because the face of poverty has become black. In each of these moments where the nation had an opportunity to choose to be otherwise, 
we double down on our ugliness. We arrested the possibility of change. Um, and we, we continue to believe the lie and this idea that white people ought to matter more than others. It is a terrible thing for an entire people to surrender to the notion that one ninth of its population is beneath them. And until that moment, until the moment comes, <coughs> when we, the Americans, we, the American people, are able to accept the fact that I have to accept, for example, that my ancestors are both white and black, that on that continent we are trying to forge a new identity for which we need each other, and that I am not a ward of America. I am not an object of missionary charity. I am one of the people who built the country. Until this moment, there is scarcely any hope for the American dream, because the people who are denied participation in it by their very presence will wreck it. And you know, so as one, you know, melo, it's not a melodramatic way of putting it, but one dramatic way of putting it is that at every moment in which a new America is about to be born, um, the umbilical cord of white supremacy has been wrapped around its neck. And I think Baldwin was, Baldwin was and remains our most insightful critic of race and democracy. Right, he understood it. Uh, at, at a level that cut to the marrow of the bone. Um, and that's why it's such, such a challenge to read him and why it's so necessary, particularly in this moment, to return to his word. Are you hopeful, Eddie, that uh, things can get better? Um, you know, Obama's second book uh, when he ran for president was called The Audacity of Hope. Um, coming away from reading begin again uh i sense that you're hopeful but uh but also very cautious because of how baldwin's life played out and also where we're at in this current political climate yeah you know there's this wonderful line um uh, in wb du bois as the souls of black folk um he says it's a hope not hopeless but unhopeful Right. So there is a sense in which it's Beckett-like, you know, that um, we, you know, fail, fail again, fail better. Um, and, and so uh, our history suggests to me that we're not going to, to make the right choice. But, you know, wherever human beings are, we have a chance. And what I, what I, mean, what I mean by begin again is, you know, Baldwin... That in that moment and just above my head, you know, it's a summation of what happened uh, in the aftermath of the, of the collapse of the Civil Rights Movement. You know, people scattered. Some went mad. Some were thrown in jail. Some were dead. Some had, had left and went overseas, had quit the country. He says, no matter, you know, that's what we know what we've done. We know what happened, he says. And then there's this moment, he says, but you know, responsibility is not lost. Responsibility is abdicated. And if one refuses abdication, then one begins again. And this is the insight of Camus, you know, you know, Sisyphus, right? This is, you know, you don't have to be an existentialist, but the point is not necessarily the end. The point is the struggle itself, the process itself what Talib Kweli might call the beautiful struggle. So it is it's my generation's turn. It's the younger generation, my son's generation, right? We have to figure out how to muster the energy to push, to push this damn boulder up the hill again. And so we begin again, right? And we hope that this time will be different. Because, you know, the American empire, this American project is not guaranteed, right? I mean, you, you, think, about, you think about post-World War II, you know, the, the economies of Europe are in shambles because of the devastation of the war. Have uh, people in the quote unquote third world who are coming, just coming out of decolonization. There's no competition on the global market in the global, in the global sphere. The U.S.'s economy brings everybody online. That doesn't obtain now. That's just not the reality. Right? And so 
there's no guarantee that this place will survive, even though, you know, our, our American confidence guessed that, that, you know, we're the redeemer nation, we're the shining city on the hill, but that's the lie that we tell ourselves to protect our innocence. So I'm hopeful because I'm hopeful in us. Baldwin says, and I think he's so right, that human beings are miracles and disasters at the same time. And, you know, so I just, wherever we are, we got a chance because, you know what? We can act miraculously out of the blue. My father, all the years that I lived with him, never dreamed of telling a white person the truth about anything. It simply never entered his mind to do so. He didn't care what they thought. He didn't care if they lived or died. He loathed them. That was very frightening for me to watch. My turn came, too. <clears throat> but I could see what had happened. And the reason it's important now is that out of this endeavor, what we call the white American has created only the nigger he wants to see. The reason that's important and terrifying and corrupts the youth from here is because when this same white man looks around the world, he sees only the nigger he wants to see. And that is morally dangerous for the future of this country, for our present fortunes. The world is full of all kinds of people who live quite beyond the confines of the American imagination and who have nothing whatever to do with the guilt-ridden vision of the world which controls so much of our life and our thinking and which paralysis, paralyzes very nearly our moral sense. We are living in a world in which everybody and everything is interdependent it is not white, this world. It is not black either. The future of this world depends on everyone in this room. And that future depends on to what extent and by what means we liberate ourselves of a, from a vocabulary which now cannot bear the weight of reality. Thank you. Again again, James Baldwin's America and its Urgent Lessons for Our Own by Eddie Glaude Jr., published by Crown, is out now in hardcover. Big Table is produced and presented by Hat and Beard Press, Dub Lab, and Gold Diggers in Los Angeles, and is supported by Invisible Republic, a nonprofit arts organization based in Chicago and Los Angeles. You can learn more about their community based programs and publications at invisiblerepublic.org. Big Table would not exist in the audio world without the expert skill sets, friendship, and dedication of sound designer Matea Bain, audio engineer Jacob Ross, and senior editor, Nick White. Special thanks to Eric Gorman at Gold Diggers and Alejandro Ale Cohen at Dub Lab for early encouragement and engineering prowess. Thanks again for listening.